in this building and outside and over in our children's building just so you can celebrate this with me we have 755 worshiping Jesus today <laughs> ladies and gentlemen it is my honor to introduce to you a man that needs no introductions. His credits, his accomplishments are too long to list. He has taken what is impossible and in mighty your life made it possible. He hails out of a manger in the city called Bethlehem. His mother is still revered by millions in the church today and his father is the author of a book that's been on the bestsellers list since the beginning of time this man that I want to introduce to you he can walk on water he can turn the water into wine he's made the lame to walk the blind to see he's been known and referred to as the king of kings of the universe some people call him the rose of Sharon he's the prince of peace and to me he is my bright and morning star over 2,000 years ago he died and he shed his blood as a sacrificial lamb for you and I for the atonement of our sin so that if we would accept him we can live forever in eternity with him but the celebratory news came this morning place where they laid his body may I announce to you the tomb is empty he's a risen savior I said he's a risen savior and he rose again that you and I could live in victory over death sin in the grave there's no grave gonna hold his body down there's no grave gonna hold my body down may I ask you to stand to your feet put your hands together let me introduce to you the king of kings his name is Jesus Christ I'm coming up out of the ground 
Well, meet me, meet me, Jesus. Meet me in the middle of the air. I'm gonna rise and meet my Lord. Gonna say goodbye to me. Ain't no way. Gonna hold my body down. We keep trying. We'll have church up in this place. <laughs> wow. Look at your neighbors and say, I almost bought that same outfit. <laughs> so, the good news today is that my message is only somewhere between five and ten minutes long. The bad news is that the introduction is about two hours. <laughs> and I need to bring you somewhere today. I need to take you somewhere. We're going to be on a journey. So if for 15 to 17 minutes you're like, where's this going? When we get there, you'll know it. Amen. Amen. Kind of like you were in a kid. Mom and dad would load us up in that two-tone green and rust station wagon to go see grandma and grandpa. We wouldn't be out of the city limits and those kids would be in the back going, are we almost there? Dad say, oh, you know it when you get there. So that's kind of how my message is this morning. You're going to know it when we get there, but it's going to take us a minute. I know that today you thought you would come to church and you would hear about Jesus and the crown of thorns him dying on the cross, him buried three days, him buried and three days later rose again, and that is the message and the celebration today. But I feel like of the 700 and something people that are here, I think you know it. I think you know it. I think you've heard it. I think you're good. And while we celebrate it, I need you to leave with something today. Look at your neighbor say, take something with you when you go. Today we're talking a message that I've chose to title, 30 Yards of Grace. 30 yards of grace. And the concept of the message is this, is that Jesus did die for our sins. He was buried and he rose again. But I need you to leave here knowing what that does for you and the person in front of you and behind you. You see, Jesus' ministry started at the age of 30. It's called his Galilean ministry and in Matthew 4. It explains some details of what had happened. And we're talking, the life that we're talking about today is the life of Peter. And I want you to see a very vivid display of Peter's life before the resurrection. And a very vivid display of Peter's life after the resurrection. Because that same Peter, I hope to bring across to you this morning in a way that you can see yourself. It was the first invitation that Peter received as Jesus is there at the bank and he's talking to them and he tells them about, did you catch any fish? No, cast you down on the other side. They caught him and they bring him in and he's like, if you'll just follow me, say follow me. follow me. I will make you fishers of men. What had Jesus done? Real quick, Jesus had offered an invitation he had offered an invitation to Peter, and today, Jesus is offering that same invitation to you and I. And that is, invitation is to what? That for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but they would have everlasting life. Amen. Well, there's the what. In Matthew 16 and 24, he gave the way. Look at your neighbor say, he's bringing us somewhere. Then Jesus said unto his disciples, though, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, 
take up his cross and follow me. So we have the what and the way, and I need the why. The why is because of Romans 3 and 23. And I don't really think that anyone in here still sins. But in the event that you do, Romans 3 and 23 says, for all have sinned. Look at your neighbor and go, "Uh uh-huh. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And then so we have the what and the way and the why. And so now here's the how. Paul tells us this so beautifully in Ephesians 2. For by grace, say by grace. Are you saved through faith, not of yourselves? I'm here today to tell you that I'm on my way to heaven, but it's all about the cross and Jesus. I'm on my way to glory land. My name's been written in the Lamb's book of life to never be blotted out. And it has nothing to do except for one decision that I made. And that was to accept the blood of Jesus for the atonement of my sin. And it is the very first invitation that I ever received. That I receive Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. And that I experience his grace. I experience his mercy. And I become a child of God. I become a Christian to the one that looked at Peter and then looked at me at the age of 15 and said, follow me. Now I need you to look at your neighbor and say, let's go forward three years. I'm going to bring you somewhere. We fast forward three years later. In Matthew 26 and 31... Then Jesus said all, to all of them, after they'd been following him for three years, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. What a horrible thing to follow Jesus for three years, to see all that Jesus did, to see all that Jesus accomplished, and for that same man to look at you and say, this very night you will be called Caused to stumble. I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I've been raised, I will go before you into Galilee. And then there's Peter. Oh, you and I can so see that. We can so see ourselves in this. Peter was angry. Peter jumped up and said, even if all, even if everyone else in this room is made to stumble because of you, I will never fail you. I will never stumble. I love you, Lord. You called me from an old way of life. You gave me a new life in Christ. I'm telling you, everyone in here may stumble. I will not stumble. We fast forward again. Jesus looks at him in verse 34. And he said, Peter, surely I say to you this night that before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. Then Peter got specific. He said, Lord, not only will I not stumble, but even if it means my very life, I will not deny you. Jesus never said anything to Peter about denying him. He just said, you're going to stumble. Now Peter gets specific. I mean, he brings it down. Not only would I not stumble, but if there's one sin, if there's one thing I'll never allow myself to do, I'll never deny you, Jesus. Look at your neighbor say, we're going quick. It ain't going to take long. Fast forward to Matthew 26. We begin reading, I believe, around 64. It says, now Peter sat outside of the courtyard. They had gotten Jesus. They had brought him down. They had begun to punish him. They had begun to strip his clothes from him and to beat upon his back with a cat of nine tails. 
They begin to beat him in his face. The Bible says that they took their hands and plucked his beard out. They began to beat him about his face and his eyes and they had placed a crown of thorns upon his head and they took a wooden mallet and began to drive those thorns into his scalp and he was filled with blood. The courthouse, I talked to a friend of mine that's been there at least three different times. And I was asking him this past week, I said, where they brought Jesus and did this, the, the courtyard, how big is it? He goes, you'll be honest, Harlan. He goes, it's very small. It's about 30 yards by 30 yards. So I want you to understand today the upfront seat that Peter had as they began to beat our Savior. The up close and personal seat that he had just 30 yards away. And a servant girl, according to the scripture, verse 69, saw Peter and says, hey, you were also with Jesus in Galilee. But he denied it before them saying, I do not know what you're saying. What a bad day for Peter. And when he had gone straightway out of the gateway, another girl saw him. He was having a terrible night. And said to those who were there, this fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth. And in verse 72, but again, Peter denied it. But watch 72. But this time he denied it with an oath. Now, the first time, he just denied him. This time, the Bible says he denied him with an oath. That's to give fact to what he's saying is that it would be like if he was in a court of law. And they said, raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth? Nothing but the truth. So help you God. And he would say, I swear. And they go, do you know him? He goes, I swear an oath. I don't know the man. A little later in verse 72, those who stood by came up and said, Peter, surely you also are one of them, for your speech betrays you. In verse 74, he says, then he began to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man. We're going to springboard for some chronological order to Luke 22, verse 60. Peter said to the man, I do not know what you're saying. And immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. Look at your neighbor say, the rooster crowed. And the description that the writer here, Luke, gives us is in 61, it says, and the Lord turned and he looked at Peter. And Peter remembered what the Lord said the moment that the rooster crowed. That Peter, you will deny me three times before the rooster crows. And immediately when he denied him, immediately the rooster crowed. You see this morning he denied him. He denied him with an oath. And he denied him and cursed. And don't you know that as Peter was there and he heard that rooster crow and the distance between here and about halfway in our auditorium, maybe a little farther, it says that Jesus looked at Peter. And don't you know as Peter saw Jesus with his eyes already blackened, the crown of thorns upon his head, the, the, the horrible face of having your, your beard plucked out by hand, the blood that was rushing down his back and the blood that was rushing down his face. Don't you know that when he heard the rooster crow and Jesus turned and looked at him, don't you know it was a life-altering kind of guilt? A kind of guilt today that I cannot even begin to fathom. A kind of guilt today that I, I can't even imagine what he must have felt. All the failure in his own life, all the disappointment, 
standing there saying, I will never stumble. And not only will I never stumble, but I'll never deny you. And the same night, he's already denied him three times. He had followed Christ for three years. He tried being a good Christian. He just couldn't do it. You see, to you and I this morning, it's just a simple little rooster crowing. But do you understand in Jerusalem, every little hut, they had a rooster. And now Peter's life would be damned that everywhere he went in the morning, he would hear a rooster Every day at midday, he would hear a rooster. Every evening, he would hear a rooster. And a rooster would wake him up at night, just roosters, roosters everywhere. Reminding him, even Satan, using that voice of a rooster to remind him of what he did to Jesus. To remind him of the denial. To remind him of all the things that he promised God would do. And the rooster would crow and bring him down again. And I'm here today to tell you that you and I, We've promised God some things since we first had the invitation of salvation. And there are things in our life that we promised God we would never do. I'll never do that. I'll never do that. And yet we have find not only did we do it, but maybe we've done it many times. And we come to church and we want to clap. We want to praise. But in the back we hear, ooh, ooh, ooh. That's as good as you get on the rooster. <laughs> Do you understand that Satan is your accuser today? And if there's one thing that he wants to do is he wants you to hear the crowing louder than you experience his 30 yards of grace. Oh, he looked at Peter. He didn't condemn Peter, but I believe he looked through him just 30 yards away. And I believe that grace and forgiveness flowed out of our Savior as he was dying that night. Amen. May I tell you today, it doesn't matter what you've promised God. Oh, I know he's called you. I know you said, Lord, I love you. God, I'll never deny you. God, I'll never forsake you. And you have. You say, oh, pastor, I've never done that. You and I may not have ever done it with our words, but we've done it by the life we've lived. We may not have said it with our words, but we've done it with our testimony. Oh, listen to me, church. Peter started this problem. Jump ahead with me in Matthew 26. We're almost there. In Matthew 26, you see, it's the problem that brings us where we are today that allows us to hear so many roosters crow. Matthew 26, 58, but Peter followed him at a distance to the high priest's courtyard. You see, sometimes we've received, if you've received the invitation to accept Christ and you've accepted him, raise your hand. Amen, all over the house. But listen to me. What happens in our Christian life, we accept Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. And then the next thing he knows, we, we get hurt or we get aggravated or, or we just get busy or we get this and we get that. And, and before long, we are guilty of what Peter did in Matthew 26. We begin to follow him at a distance. We're not as close as we used to be. I still love him, but his house isn't that important to me. I still love him, but his word's not a, a priority to me. I still love him, but prayer's not... You know, I, I pray when I need him. I say, following him at a distance. Say it better than that. Say, follow him at a distance. See, Peter followed him at a distance. He says, I've tried Christianity. I failed the Lord in the greatest way a person can follow him. And he goes, look, at the end of the day, I promised some God some things I wouldn't do, and I did it three times. I just got to have, you know, the Bible says confession's good for the soul. I thought about this morning just passing the mic and letting y'all tell some of y'all's sins. I couldn't find anybody to go first. But I, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to raise my hand first. How many of you have ever told God that you wouldn't do something? And not only did you do it, 
But you did it over and over and over and over. Hallelujah. Amen. You see, we promise God all the time. We promise God all the time. In John 21, verse 3, Peter gave up on his Christian life. He gave up on his Christian life. The scripture says it like this. Simon Peter said unto them, I'm going fishing. Now that's not like Bryant and I saying we're going fishing. Or me and Mike saying we're going fishing. Peter was saying this didn't work for me. I'm going back to my old way of life. I'm going back to my old way of life. I've tried it and I've tried it and I've tried it. It didn't work for me. I'm going back to my old way of life. I've either had God's people fail me or I failed God. I'm going back to my old way of life. For too long, we've been following him at a distance now. And then glory to God, John 21, verse 4. It says, But then the morning came. You see, Peter had a life that he loved the Lord. And on the very night Jesus died, he swore and cursed that he didn't even know him. The reeked in his emotion with guilt. I want you to know something. I don't know where you were with Jesus yesterday, but I'm here today to tell you that morning has come to you today. A new day. The past is over. But when the morning come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. He was in his resurrected body, and Jesus said to them, children, do you have any food? And they said, no. And he said to them, cast your net on the other side of the boat, and you'll find some. So they cast and were not able to draw it because of the multitude of the fish. And then it gets more interesting. Suddenly they're like, deja vu. We don't know who's on the shore, but John looks at Peter and says, hey, we've heard this before. And he turns to look at Peter, and Peter's already put his clothes on. He put his swimsuit on, jumped in the boat, and he's swimming to the shore. He knew that miracle because he had experienced that miracle once before. And may I tell you today, the very miracle for your salvation that you experience is the same miracle that God is using this morning to call you back to Jesus. He still loves you. <laughs> he still needs you. Oh, I like this. Now we're to the message. I tell you, it's only 10 minutes. Besides that, I don't think I'm going to last any longer. You see, Jesus showed Peter 30 yards of grace because this encounter now was specifically set up to restore what was broken. You see, because of the empty tomb today, because of the empty tomb today, you and I get more than one chance. Look at your neighbor say, that's cool with me, but you better really be glad. <laughs> because of the empty tomb today, we get more than one chance. This encounter is the same thing, calling once again Peter for you to turn to the work. But listen, but Peter's no longer the same person that he was before he denied Christ. He no longer feels worthy. He no longer feels like that he can lead out in the men's group anymore. No longer feels like he can sing in the band. and No longer feels like he can do the things that God has called him to do. And it's because he's listening to the crow of the rooster rather than the grace of God. May I tell you this morning, if you hear nothing else that I say, there's nothing that God's ever wanted you to do that the devil can steal from you if you'll but turn to Jesus. Amen. Oh, the rooster's reminding him of all the mistakes he made. 
that he felt unworthy. But today, the Resurrection Sunday, just in Peter's life to restore him. Oh, listen to what, listen to what, <laughs> listen to what Jesus said. He said, Peter, those same lips that denied me, that same tongue that cursed and swore an oath that you didn't even know me. Peter, it's only a few days from now that that same tongue is going to be preaching on the day of Pentecost where more people are saved than has ever been saved in the, up to this point in history. Do you understand that, Peter? I still need you. I still want you. And I'll use you in a greater way than you ever imagined. Do you understand, Peter, it's that same person that you're feeling unworthy. Peter, it's that person that you're going to walk by the temple gate and someone's going to stand, stand and want something from you and you're going to say, silver and gold, have I none, but as I, what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk and they're going to be healed that day. Do you understand God can use you and me right where we are if we will but receive the second invitation of follow me? Let me tell you what they ended up doing. They ended up, when they would find out Peter would come to town, they would get their sick and they would lay them along the edge of the streets in hope that just very, that the very shadow of Peter's body would touch their sick and then be made whole. You see, there's not anything this morning that God can't do with you. God says, follow me. He told me to follow him when I was 15. And from the time I'm 15 to the age that I am now, it's one. <laughs> I promise you, I have failed. Uh, there are times that I have failed my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But because of the resurrection, he just says, I know you love me. I know you've been following me at a distance, but I still need you. I still love you. We're going to do a little exercise together here that's very unusual, but I want you to read this for me. I want in that blank, when we begin to read this together, I want you to say your name out loud, and I want you to read this with me if we would. You ready? Okay. Harlan. I died for you because I love you. And there is nothing you could have ever done that keeps me from loving you. And Harlan, I still need you. Come and follow me. Will you give the Lord a hand praise this morning? It's because of Calvary. It's because of Calvary. I would just like to ask you this morning, and I, it, it may not even be enough room, but we're going to do this. Please don't leave here today and not know the resurrected Savior's invitation, number one. Don't leave here today and not know the resurrected Savior. But number two, if you've already had that first invitation, but you know you have failed him, and you know today that he still loves you, you know today that you still love him. I want you to put my last comment up. Never listen to the condemnation of a crowing rooster when you have a risen Savior. Amen. Amen. Never listen to it. Never listen to the condemnation of a crowing rooster. And see, you may be thinking about a cock-a-doodle-doo. I'm going to tell you that there's some folks in my life that are roosters. There's some people in my life that are roosters. Always reminded me of my mistakes. Always reminded me of maybe what I've not been up to par with. I'm telling you, I don't have to listen to them anymore because of a day called Resurrection Sunday. So maybe you just want to come and you want to rededicate your life. I'm going to have my wife standing here. I'm going to have some of my lay pastors and elders here. They'll pray with you. Whatever your decision for Jesus is, I'll ask you to stand right where you are. You come. Just as I am.
as I am without one plea. Amen. Won't you come? Sing one more verse, and that's all. Amen. You be seated as there are those still here praying. We're going to get our ushers to come forward and, and take up our morning offering. If you've been blessed today, give the Lord a hand praise. <laughs> Bryant Champagne joked that we always have this many. I will tell you, for those that are visiting, the Lord has blessed our church. Amen. Last Sunday, we did have 503 the Sundays before that, we've been running 480 and 490, and God just continues to bless. All I want to tell you is this. We're not about being a Baptist church. We're not about being a cowboy church. We're not about being a Pentecostal church. We're not about being a Lutheran church. We're not about being an Assembly of God church. We're just about a church that loves Jesus and wants other people to get to know him, and that's it. That's it. So if you want to come and join us, as long as you leave your church outside, we're good. All we want is Jesus in here. That's it. Just leave Jesus. That's all. We, we just want Jesus in here. And I'm going to tell you, God, you, God is doing some great things. He'll continue to do some great things. And I'm going to quit talking because I have two more messages I'd love to bring right now. Y'all stand. Let's pray. Where's my bride? There you are. Pray with me, church. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Tell two people you love them.